feel um, uh, more secure because um, the president is, quote, a fighting machine who has dropped 15 pounds and cut his time in the mile to seven minutes. <laughs> Vanity Fair uh, ran a cover story photo essay describing Bush and um, his cabinet as the Magnificent Seven. Uh, and his story assigned these kind of raw knuckled nicknames um, to each of Bush's men. So Cheney became The Rock, uh, Ashcroft was The Heat, uh, and Tom Ridge was The Protector. Uh, the magazine actually further lionized Ridge, uh, uh, praising him for his, quote, prominent Buzz Lightyear jaw, which the magazine said gave him the right appearance for a director of Homeland Security. Uh, the new post-9-11 American man in general was uh, described as a red meat eater. Uh, a Washington Post article declared that thanks to 9-11, we were, quote, heading back into a time when real men bring home the bacon and their women cook it up. Rudy Giuliani was described in Newsweek as a man who ate, quote, meats that sweat. <laughs> and when cabinet members gathered right after the attacks at Camp David, um, much was made of the fact that they were dining on what was billed as a, quote, Wild West menu of buffalo meat. Um, all of these stories were uh, characterized by one uh, nationally syndicated columnist this way. So long, sissy boys. Goodbye, sensitive man. After 30 years of wimpifying its men, turning us all into spit-shine, dough-balled, egg-headed, girly boys who can clip a cuticle. <laughs> Manly men are back in vogue. Guys who are not afraid to get their hands dirty and who don't necessarily worry about washing them before eating a liverwurst and onion sandwich. <laughs> and this is the model of manhood women were uh, supposedly swooning to date after 9-11, according to the newspapers. Um, on television, the new manly man wasn't just a hunky firefighter. Uh, increasingly, he was a violent vigilante. Uh, a study by the group Human Rights First found that um, acts of torture on primetime television had gone from fewer than four a year before 9-11 uh, to more than 100. And the torturers, who in the past were almost entirely uh, the villains, were now um, so often the show's heroes. Uh, these were heroes emulated, uh, ultimately, by so many U.S. soldiers in Iraq uh, that the military brass uh, met with the producers of the show 24 uh, to plead with them to stop exalting torture. And then there was the return of the Duke. Uh, there were all these media salutes to the so-called return of John Wayne. We probably, you probably remember the, one of the more famous ones, Peggy Noonan's. Uh, where she says, you know, welcome back, Duke. You know, uh, from the ashes of 9-11 arise the manly virtues, men who push things and pull things and tell everyone else where to go. Uh, the, there were endless uh, reruns of John Wayne movies. Uh, the recording industry even reissued John Wayne's America, Why I Love Her, uh, with the Duke reciting patriotic speeches and the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, some of this, although not all of it, may um, sound you know, odd but relatively harmless if it weren't for the fact that it took over our public life, starting with our presidential politics. Look at the 2004 presidential campaign. Uh, the candidates seem to be competing for the title of Davy Crockett in chief, and bragging about their gun collections in the press, uh, hacking at sagebrush and tree stumps. Uh, John Kerry was, you know, out every weekend shooting wild animals and waving the bloody pelts at journalists. Um, when the candidates weren't locking and loading, they were vowing to protect mothers and their children from uh, marauding terrorists in the suburbs. Bush announced that he was guarding us from enemies who would, quote, strike our homes. 
Uh, and John Kerry said he would fight terrorism because it was, quote, my sacred duty to protect the bond between a mother and child. So here we have all the elements of the myth. The strong, inflated man, the woman uh, cowering back at the homestead. All that's missing is the rescue of the girl, uh, preferably one who is in danger of being violated. And that's where the Jessica Lynch story comes in, a, a story that agitated our culture for months on end. You all remember how this story supposedly went, uh, that special ops teams you know, battled their way into an Iraqi hospital after midnight uh, to rescue Lynch from bloodthirsty Fedayeen death squads uh, who, it was insinuated without any evidence, um, may have raped her. In reality, there was no fight. There were no death squads, as the military knew, because they had been informed that the Fedayeen, the last few remaining Fedayeen, who were basically just hiding in the cellar, um, had, had long gone. Uh, it was just a bunch of doctors and nurses uh, trying to take care of Lynch and actually trying to return her to the US military, um, an effort that failed when they got to uh, a checkpoint and the Marines began shooting at the ambulance and they had to return her. Um, but that story of the daring raid and the helpless rescued girl was very important to us as a culture. Um, now, uh, more recently, there was a, a certain amount of debunking of the Jessica Lynch story within the, uh, within the last year over whether she fired her gun or not, whether she was a you know, Rambo or not, which if you go back and look at it, um, that, the, the, I, the whole story about her shooting until she ran out of bullets was actually a one-day story that the, the media um, immediately jumped on and attacked. Um, it, it was a story that ran in the Washington Post and then was um, uh, uh, taken back over and over again for months on end. Um, but there's one element that hasn't been focused on, and that's the transformation of a soldier who enlisted not once but twice into a delicate, helpless little maiden. Um, so I thought I'd just read you a, 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 just a few paragraphs from my book that describes this, um, how the media sort of remade her. We cast our male soldiers returning from the war zone as battle-tested, seasoned, tougher, old beyond their years. But the post-war Lynch would be lauded not for her hard-won maturity, but for having remained a girl. Her virtue lay in her preserved and aspic innocence. She hasn't changed one bit, a typical media report assured, after consulting with her kindergarten teacher. <laughs> the celebration of her perpetual childhood began immediately with media accounts from the military hospital in Germany that described her as the tiny girl and the blonde waif. She was said to be clutching a teddy bear. She was said to favor applesauce and steamed carrots. She was said to be dreaming of washing her hair and styling it with a curling iron. She was said to be asking for her mother. Stateside, reporters flocked to Palestine, West Virginia, her, her hometown, uh, to harvest sugar and spice details from kindergarten teachers and grade school playmates. Her grandmother called her precious little Jessie, the media reported. Little Jessie was, according to various dispatches, a, quote, princess laying out her clothes every night, who liked, hair ribbons to, who liked her hair ribbons to match her outfits, and, quote, a little girl who loved pink dresses and perfect hair. We learned that she once fractured her arm and insisted on a pink cast to go with her pink shoelaces, that she used to play with Barbies, that she presided at the, in the, over, as the Ward County Fair's Miss Congeniality, uh, that she couldn't hit the ball at all in softball, wore small waisted dresses, and was every mother's dream of a teenage daughter. When the former New York Times reporter Rick Bragg sat down um, some months later to write his account of Lynch called, I am a soldier too, he devoted a chapter titled Princess to the enumeration of her maidenly attributes. 
The chapter's first sentence is, her bangs were always perfect. The biography of a good girl follows. She was born tiny and beautiful, a quote, doll-like little girl who was almost as quiet as one and never any trouble. In middle school, she was a cheerleader in, quote, little pleated skirts. Even while playing school sports, she was, quote, always perfectly made up. As Miss Congeniality, she was, quote, radiant in her burgundy form-hugging gown. In other words, the princess belonged in beauty pageants, not boot camp. Quote, her fatigue swallowed her like a big frog, Bragg wrote. She looked like a child who had sneaked into her dad.